Hello and welcome to today's session. We'll be looking at Letters from Yorkshire by British poet Maura Dooley, which is one of the poems in the Love and Relationships collection of the GCSC Poetry Anthology for AQA. Before we begin, a little bit of background about Dooley herself. She was born in 1957 and she, for the most part, is a poet, but has also worked as a teacher. And she's published several collections of poetry, including Explaining Magnetism, Kissing a Bone, Sound Barrier, Life Underwater, and The Silvering. Dooley herself worked in the county of Yorkshire for a period of time, and so the poem is likely autobiographical in nature, although it must be remembered that the speaker in the poem um, could be an invention of Dooley's, a kind of persona that she's created in order to tell a story. So you can't be certain um, that it is Dooley herself talking about her own um, relationships. It was uh, inspired by a letter she received from a friend who lived in Yorkshire and kind of deals with the themes of communication and relationships. One of the things that kind of runs through the story is this idea of missing a place and a friend. So in some respects, it deals with this kind of broader idea of feeling homesick in a way for a place that you used to live in. So let's take a look at the poem itself. Letters from Yorkshire by Maura Dooley. In February, digging his garden, planting potatoes, he saw the first lapwings return and came indoors to write to me, his knuckles singing as they reddened in the warmth. It's not romance, simply how things are. You out there, in the cold, seeing the seasons turning, me with my heart full of headlines, feeding words onto a blank screen. Is your life more real because you dig than sow? You wouldn't say so, breaking ice on a water butt, clearing a path through snow. Still, it's you who sends me word of that other world, pouring air and light into an envelope, so that at night, watching the same news in different houses, our souls tap out messages across the icy miles. So what's the story of the poem? Well, it's winter time and nearly spring and we have a gardener planting potatoes in the ground so they'll grow through the spring and the summer. We know it's nearly spring because the lapwings have returned. A lapwing is a type of bird that normally appears in the spring. And this farmer or gardener is writing letters to a pen pal who works for a newspaper. We have this reference to a heart full of headlines. We know the speaker in the poem is some kind of journalist and the speaker reflects on the long distance relationship that they have. Now it's some kind of friendship, it's not a romantic relationship. We get told explicitly it's not a romantic one. And the journalist character starts reflecting on the differences between their lives. We have the farmer or the gardener doing very practical everyday things outside, clearing um, some ice off a water butt, for example. A water butt is a container which collects rainwater to use to water your crops. And this character sends letters to the journalist character or the journalist speaker um, so they have this kind of pen pal relationship and it's clear from various lines in the poem that the speaker really really misses um, this friend who lives in Yorkshire. That's a very loose general overview let's have a look more closely at the language and unpick what's going on. Let's begin with the general structure of the poem and what we might say about it. The poem has five unrhymed tercets and you might wonder what a tercet is. Well, it's quite simply a three-line stanza. So, for example, three lines here, three lines here, and so on. So there are five distinct stanzas in the poem, five tercets. And so we can see the kind of the regular structure there, and we can also see that there is no rhyme scheme. There's a lot of enjambment used as a structural feature. So enjambment remembers where a line runs over the end into the next one. So it's not end stopped in any way. So here we can see this sentence isn't end stopped. It runs over into the following line. So in February, digging his garden, planting potatoes, he saw the first lapwings return and came indoors to write to me, his knuckles singing as they reddened in warmth. And we get several examples of this throughout the poem. And you'll find um, for the most part, each of the tercets is actually linked in some way um, by the enjambment in the poem. So we can see some examples here. Right, so what's the purpose of this enjambment? What's it trying to suggest? Well, it could be that it's the idea of the immediate and continual thoughts of the journalist speaker who's thinking about this friend who lives in Yorkshire. 
it might also express this idea of yearning, this longing. So although they're disconnected, the enjambment, in a way, joins these lines together and joins these tercets together to express the longing and yearning of the speaker to connect with this friend. And it could also, more broadly, given the references to nature and springtime uh, and wintertime, it might also just represent the way in which the seasons are strung together, one link into the, uh, the next. So what else might we say about the poem? Well, let's look at the individual uh, tercets, these individual stanzas, and unpick them a little bit more. So first of all, this is a lapwing. So this is how we know it's nearly springtime. This type of bird normally appears um, as the spring comes on. So we can tell that the winter is nearly over. So this is the very first part of the poem. In February, digging his garden, planting potatoes, he saw the first lapwings return and came indoors to write to me, his knuckles singing as they reddened in the warmth. You'll notice I've um, put the I've put this line in grey because technically it's not part of this first tercet, but the enjambment does kind of connect the idea. So what can we say about this first tercet? Well, we have the verbs digging and planting, um, which are connected um, to the activities of this gardener and express his kind of practical, um, very much his kind of outdoor personality, um, which is partly connected to this semantic field of nature and the outdoors. And we could even include lapwings in that semantic field um, because they are an outdoor bird that appears come springtime. What else can we say? Well, we have some nice use of metaphor. This gardener has his knuckles singing as they reddened in the warmth. So knuckle singing, it's very positive, very musical, um, very kind of pleasant kind of idea. Um, but it's really kind of describing the way in which your knuckles on your hands get red when you do lots of physical outdoor work, particularly if you've been digging the hard ground. Remember, in wintertime, the ground would be particularly hard. So you've been working really hard to kind of turn the ground over to be able to put these seedlings down um, to grow things. But this, um, the associations of singing are very positive, very musical. So it's obviously a very sympathetic and romantic portrait of this garden and what he does. On top of that, we have this really positive imagery of temperature. So his knuckles getting red in the warmth. It's the warmth, obviously, of the labour he's doing. But of course, we need to keep in mind that this reddened in the warmth has associations with very positive um, ideas, positive moods and so on. So we get this very kind of warm hearted um, presentation of the gardener character. It's very clear that the speaker admires and loves him. Um, although keep in mind that that love may be um, the love of a friend for another friend. It's not um, a romantic relationship. So let's take a look at the second tercet. It's not romance, simply how things are. You out there in the cold, seeing the seasons turning. Me with my heart full of headlines, feeding words onto a blank screen. So again, we can see how um, the second terse is already connected by enjambment into the third. But let's just focus specifically on the language in the second terse for now. Well, we have a very matter of fact tone and we're explicitly told that this is not a romantic relationship. Um, this matter of fact tone implies that it's something else, perhaps a friendship or maybe a, a relationship with a family member. Um, but it doesn't seem to be a romantic one. On top of that, we are given a sense that the narrator is aware that they are romanticizing the farmer and what he does. Um, so they are aware that of this romanticization. And this romantic view might just be expressing the speaker's longing to return to Yorkshire and the fact that the speaker in the poem is missing this friend in Yorkshire. Um, but it's also making very clear from this line simply how things are that for the farmer, it's not a romantic relationship that he has with the land. Um, it's not a romantic way to live. It's simply a practical reality for him. It's just what he does for his normal day to day life. We also have some interesting use of monosyllabic words. You out there in the cold. You'll notice each of these words has one syllable. So what's the purpose of that? Well, it could be that the simple grammar here is designed to reflect the simplicity of this farmer or gardener character's life. And in a way, it kind of romanticizes it. The um, speaker in the poem is perhaps working or living in a city or town as a journalist and is thinking of this kind of country lifestyle and how much more simple it would be, romanticising it. We also have the use of enjambment here. You out there in the cold seeing the seasons turning. 
So you might wonder, well, what's the point of splitting that line over into the next tercet? Well, perhaps the idea of the seasons turning being split over these two lines is to express the flow of time and how the seasons change. But it also might be this continual idea of the distance between the speaker and this friend in Yorkshire. So the lines not being end stopped and running over into the following tercet like this is expressed in the way in which they are, if you like, divided. You know, the lines are divided across the tercets because their relationship is divided by distance, the physical geography that's between them. Let's have a look at the next tercet. So you'll notice that the, the most of this tercet actually is taken up by the previous sentence that began in the, the previous tercet. So we have you out there in the cold seeing the seasons turning, me with my heart full of headlines feeding words onto a blank screen. So we have some interesting use of alliteration. Heart full of headlines tells us that the speaker in the poem most likely works as a journalist. And heart full obviously has very positive associations which implies that this person loves being a journalist and working away in a town or a city somewhere far from Yorkshire. But despite that, they still obviously miss the county and miss going back to Yorkshire. So it still has connotations of longing and homesickness. So this idea of having heart full of emotions. So it may be that those emotions are emotions of longing, homesickness and, and a desire to go back to Yorkshire and see this friend. We have this interesting metaphor, feeding words onto a blank screen. So there is a kind of comparison being set up here. Typing words into computers being compared to planting crops. So the farmer grows potatoes, which feed people. This journalist feeds words into a newspaper story on a computer and so feeds the mind. So there's this kind of comparison being established here. In a way, it creates this juxtaposition between crops and words. And it might be that the comparison is an attempt by the speaker to create a connection with their friend in Yorkshire. Some more interesting structural features. We have a nice rhetorical question to end this tercet. And in fact, this is one of the few times where we see a tercet end stop like this. Is your life more real because you dig and sow? Uh, sowing in this sense means to plant crops. Obviously the digging is the digging of the ground, um, which we saw in the very first tercet. This rhetorical question is very important. It sets up the central issue of the poem, this idea of a question of identity and lifestyle. The journalist wonders if this gardener farmer character uh, who's digging the fields in Yorkshire, if he has a more natural, more real and immediate and pleasurable life because he has that presence of mind by being connected to nature. It's this idea of reality um, coming through in the poem. And it also implies to an extent that the speaker, despite loving their job as a journalist, the heart full of headlines, remember, suggest they like their job, is still kind of having doubts about the nature of what they do for their life um, and their job compared to their friend in Yorkshire. Let's have a look at the next tercet. You wouldn't say so. Breaking ice in a water butt, clearing a path through snow. Still, it's you who sends me word of that other world, pouring air and light into an envelope. Well, this is interesting you wouldn't say so, is a sense, an answer to the previous rhetorical question. So what this is, is hyperphora. So answering the rhetorical question. So despite the tercets being separated, once again, we have something linking them together, a bit like the enjambment connected the tercets in the other parts of the poem. We also have a very matter of fact tone coming through again in the poem. You wouldn't say so, breaking ice in a water butt, clearing a path through snow. So it's this idea that while the speaker in the poem is having doubts about their own life as a journalist living in a town or a city and thinking, I wonder if my life is as real or as meaningful as you know, working on the land, being out in the countryside, the speaker realises that it doesn't matter. Their friend would still reassure them that what they are doing is still important. And so we get this kind of sense of reassurance coming through in the poem. But we also get this kind of idea of the very practical activities like breaking the ice in a water butt and clearing a path through snow, just as we did with the digging for you know, planting the potatoes, it creates this idea that the farmer character or the gardener character is a very kind of no nonsense type who just gets on with things and is very practically minded. We also see a nice asyndetic list at this point. So breaking ice in a water butt, clearing a path through snow. There's no conjunction linking these two things together. So that makes it an asyndetic list. Um, a syndetic list is the type that would have and in it. So it'd be breaking ice in a water butt and clearing a path through snow. So the fact there's no and present at this, um, in this list makes it asyndetic. 
So what's the point of that? Well, the idea really is to just kind of reinforce the kind of the no nonsense kind of attitude of the gardener. You know, it almost creates kind of a rush sense of him getting on with different jobs and not having time to stop and dwell on more kind of romanticised or philosophical questions of identity. Almost ties in um, to some respect with a kind of Yorkshire stereotype of a no nonsense uh, mindset. We have the caesura, this full stop between snow and still. Again, another kind of idea of the separation between them, the fact that they are disconnected and in a way living in separate worlds. This gardener farmer character living in the countryside on land and the journalist speaker of the poem working in some kind of town or city. But nevertheless, we get this lovely, very small subordinate clause. It's a single word phrase, still, which is designed to create a sense of constancy and reassurance. And it suggests that their friendship endures, even though there's a great distance between them. And we have this lovely figurative language, more use of metaphor. Still, it's you who sends me word of that other world, pouring air and light into an envelope. So it's this idea that their, their lives are so different that it's almost as if they are living in different worlds. Journalists living in a town or city, presumably, and this gardener farmer character living in the country landscape of Yorkshire. So it reinforces this idea that Yorkshire feels very far away to the speaker. And it also reestablishes those ideas of longing and yearning for perhaps an old home. So if this is indeed um, Dooley talking to us about her own memories of Yorkshire, her own feelings about friends who still live there, it could be about homesickness. But of course, as I said earlier, we can't be certain that the speaker in the poem is Dooley herself. It could be a fictitious persona that she's invented. But nevertheless, there's still a sense of longing and yearning for this other place, this other world. We also have a lovely use of alliteration and assonance. So the W of word, the W of world, combined with the O, R sound. So the word, world. We have a very similar and yet very slight subtle difference between these two words. So on the one hand, the similar sounds suggest this idea of a connection between them, that the speaker longs to be close to his world. But that slight subtle difference in sound also reinforces that sense of the distance between them. You know, the sounds are very close, but they're not identical, not exactly. Let's have a look at the final tercet. Still, it's you who sends me word of that other world, pouring air and light into an envelope, so that at night, watching the same news in different houses, our souls tap out messages across the icy miles. So already you'll remember that the opening of this sentence actually begins in the previous tercet, so we have more enjambment to start. We have this lovely use of figurative language, this metaphor that the farmer gardener character, when they write letters about the practical things they're doing to work the land, it's as if they're putting part of Yorkshire inside the envelope, the air of Yorkshire, the light of Yorkshire inside it, which makes the speaker in the poem feel very loved and cared for and very kind of rejuvenated and happy about receiving these stories and things from Yorkshire because it makes her remember this place. Air and light have connotations of nature, of um, sustenance. Air, remember, keeps us alive. And light obviously has very positive associations. You know, it makes us think of things like heaven. And in a way, it also reinforces this idea that the gardener farmer character, his world is more natural than the speaker's because it's connected to air and light, so connected to nature. But the positive language of air and light is a kind of very invigorating language. It kind of, it's restorative. So it's as if this relationship that they have as pen pals is sustaining and life affirming for the speaker. We get a lovely embedded parenthetical clause in the middle of this sentence. So that at night, watching the same news in different houses, our souls tap out messages across the icy miles. So on one level, it's this kind of whimsical thinking because the Speaker is watching the news at home on television, presumably. And while they're watching that show, they're thinking, I wonder if my friend in Yorkshire is watching this exact same thing right now. And that creates a sense of you know, reassurance because they feel connected to their friend, even though they're physically very, very far away. And it might be, but the embedded parenthetical clause is also designed to reinforce that idea. So by having it in the middle of the sentence, in a way, it's bringing them together. It's connecting those two parts. So it reintroduces the idea of finding a way to use language to create a connection to overcome the distance. And the tercet concludes with some more figurative language, this idea of our souls tapping out messages. 
So the tapping is obviously a reference to working on a keyboard, typing out the, the letters. So it suggests that they um, use a computer. Um, but of course, it's not themselves who are writing the message so much as their souls. So there's very obvious religious connotations to that language. It has a very spiritual quality to it, which suggests that these um, pen pals have a very deep and profound connection. And they remain very, very closely connected, despite the, the large distance that exists between them. The adjective icy. Um, introduces this idea of the kind of the negativity of that distance. This idea of winter and the cold and loneliness. Um, we saw winter referred to back in the February of the first Tercet. So it suggests that the distance is very cold and unforgiving and in some ways very unpleasant for the speaker. So this pen power relationship is, is in a way sustaining them through this cold time. So the poem for the most part is a very positive one all about the way in which a relationship can be life-affirming and sustaining. So what next? What can we do to get ready for the exam? Well, you might think it's going to be very difficult to remember poems, particularly as there's so many in the anthology. Well, that's perhaps true. But what you can do is memorise a small collection of lines from each poem so that you have a handful of things that you could say about each one and it will also make it easier to remember things to then compare with whichever poem gets printed in the exam paper. So we need to try and pick out three key lines to remember. And ideally one from the beginning, one from the middle and one from the end. So we cover the whole range of ideas in the poem. First one we could go for is this one. His knuckles singing as they reddened in the warmth. We talked about how that is a lovely use of metaphor. It also combines the feature of enjambment and also introduces the idea of the gardener farmer character as this very musical, positive and pleasant kind of character. We have the um, imagery of warmth, so the association with positivity coming through in the temperature and in the red colour. So there's lots we could do with that single line in terms of language analysis. For our second, we could go for this one roughly from the middle of the poem. You out there in the cold, seeing the seasons turning, me with my heart full of headlines feeding words onto a blank screen. So we have the enjambment here. So seasons runs over into turning. So it allows us to talk about the idea of how the enjambment is used to show the distance and the kind of the gap between them created by that geographical separation. It allows us to talk about the passage of the seasons, the other idea that the enjambment suggests. And we get this lovely use of alliteration and this contrast between feeding words with planting crops. So food in, in his case and words in the speakers. So we get this lovely use of juxtaposition between those two ideas. For our third and final quotation, we could go for this one. Still, it's you who sends me word of that other world, pouring air and light into an envelope. So we get that lovely use of alliteration and assonance um, in word and world, suggesting the idea that they want to be very close to each other, but the subtle sound differences reinforcing this idea that they're actually still apart. We have that lovely rich imagery of air and light in an envelope, so this idea of the friendship being life affirming restorative, invigorating and very positive. So those three lines would give us plenty of scope to talk about language and score highly for AO2. Let's just go over them one last time. His knuckles singing as they reddened in the warmth. You out there in the cold, seeing the seasons turning. Me with my heart full of headlines, feeding words onto a blank screen. Still it's you who sends me word of that other world, pouring air and light into an envelope. So you might want to pause the video at this point and see if you can actually remember some of these. Try and memorise them or perhaps even transfer them to some flashcards that you could put up in your room or use as you get closer towards the exam to test yourself just before. Either way, you need to make sure that you do something similar for each of the poems so that you've got some useful specific quotes that you can talk about. What are the themes then that come through in Letters from Yorkshire? Well, we have the idea of love. Remember, love doesn't have to be romantic. It can be familial love. It could be that of um, friends, what we call platonic love. Uh, so this poem seems to be leaning towards the idea of platonic love, the love between two friends. We get the theme of longing, this idea of the distance between the speaker and their friend in Yorkshire, creating this idea of their longing to return, both to see the county of Yorkshire, but also to see their friend. So the idea of distance, both physical distance, geographical distance, but also the emotional distance created. We get the idea of different lives in the poem. So the speaker asks this question, is your life more real um, because you dig and sow? 
And so that question sets up this idea that they wonder about their own life choices and they're comparing themselves to their friend. And this idea of comparing lives comes up in some of the other poems in the anthology. And of course, we get the idea of nature running through the poem, both through the activity of gardening and digging, um, the references to lapwings and so on. So nature is an important thing that runs through this one. And it would allow you to compare this poem to some of the different poems in the anthology that on the surface otherwise seem like they can't be compared. However, saying that, there are some very easy poems to use that you could go to if you wanted to compare Letters from Yorkshire to something else in the anthology. So which poems could we go for? Well, we could start off with something like Follower by Seamus Heaney, because in that poem you have a speaker who is the son of a farmer and the son is remembering his dad and thinking about how much he misses them. But also he thinks about how his life compares to his father's life. So it's a very similar thing happening in Letters from Yorkshire with the journalist comparing the life they lead in the town or the city to the life of their farmer, gardener friend who lives and works in the country. You could also compare Letters from Yorkshire to Climbing My Grandfather by Andrew Waterhouse. You could talk simply about how these poems are about fond memories of loved ones. Um, climbing my grandfather, we have a grandson fondly remembering or thinking about his granddad. And obviously in Letters from Yorkshire, we have the journalist speaker fondly remembering their friend up in Yorkshire. You could also compare Letters from Yorkshire to Walking Away by C. Day Lewis. And in that one, you might talk about how the two speakers try and come to terms with the idea of distance. So if you remember in Walking Away, we have a dad remembering his son and remembering how he came to terms with the fact that they would have to grow apart, both emotionally and, of course, physically in time. And so the idea of emotional distance and physical distance runs through that poem, and also it runs through Letters from Yorkshire very strongly too. If you wanted to, you could go for something a little bit different. You could compare Letters from Yorkshire to Sonnet 29 by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, because in that poem we have a speaker thinking about the effects of their own distance from their lover and how it makes them feel. And obviously we have the speaker in that poem longing to be near to their love interest and feeling the physical and emotional effects of being far away from them. So although that's dealing with a very different kind of love, the effects of distance on a relationship is still an important theme that runs through the poem and obviously is a central theme in Letters from Yorkshire. Although in Letters from Yorkshire, of course, it's about the way in which it impacts on a friendship rather than a romantic relationship. So that concludes our session today. I hope you found the reading and analysis of Letters from Yorkshire useful, either for your study of the poem or for your revision as you get nearer towards the exam. But otherwise, take care and see you next time. <laughs>